Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey, and today we're going to be discussing psychedelic therapy, slow down to go fast with Sunny Strasberg. Sunny is a licensed psychotherapist, educator, and pioneering author, and she specializes in psychedelic therapies and training clinicians to be skilled and trauma-informed psychedelic therapists. As the founder and author of The Theradelic Approach, she equips clinicians with trauma-informed psychedelic-assisted therapy methods, blending IFS, EMDR, archetypal psychology, trauma-informed care, and her extensive experience. Everyone, I'm really looking forward to this. We are going to be talking about how slowing down to the speed of the protective system is really beneficial for those undergoing psychedelic therapy and how that quote unquote heroic dose is not so heroic in a lot of cases. So please tune into this whole episode. I'm really excited about it. Now, before we get to Sunny, just a reminder that the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing here is to be construed as medical or legal advice. And one last reminder, if you are a clinician and you'd like to learn more about psychedelic medicines and how they might help your patients, please check out the Psychedelic Medicine Association. It is our mission to get you educated on psychedelics and their therapeutic uses and their indications and contraindications so that you feel comfortable having discussions with your patients and referring them when appropriate. Please check us out at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Now, without further ado, thanks for joining us today, Sunny. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Lynn Marie. I really appreciate being here. I'm excited to have our conversation. Me too. I have to tell everybody that I uh, wanted Sunny to do this topic because I saw her uh, social media post where she was speaking on this. And I thought, oh, that so resonates with me because first off, we're I think we're all kind of overcoming as a society, this like more is better, harder and faster hustle culture. I think we're, we're getting that maybe that hasn't been as beneficial as people have been telling us for decades. And I think psychedelic therapy may be one of the areas where we need to be reminded that the hustling there and the more is not always better. Um, So Sunny, start us off wherever you would like to on this discussion, but maybe even if you could just mention a little bit what you've seen in patients where they may have, like you may have had to redirect their thought process on, you know, they might come to you like, I want to do the biggest dose. I want to go the most amount of sessions. Talk a little bit about, about some of that reframing you, you do. Absolutely. Um, you know, as you're talking, Lynn Marie, I'm thinking about this bigger conversation, which is, um, you know, we're really focused in our culture on taking a magic pill, having everything be better so that we can be highly functioning, just like you said, the hustle culture, right? How can I get back to work and get functional? I don't want to deal with my depression or PTSD or whatever. Right. And, and, So I really like to pull the lens back and really think about things in a holistic way, right? That it's, that it's the the medicine, but it's also the therapy. I really see the medicines as an amplifier and a almost like a power tool to go to fit within a larger context of the rapport with the therapist, the skill and the training of the therapist, um, making sure that you're doing enough preparation, you know, before doing the journey in a beautiful setting that feels comfortable and safe doing integration, right? So, so just kind of couching this whole conversation into this bigger holistic view of what is mental health and how can we provide optimal outcomes for people, you know? So with that, um, you know, I'd love your question. How do you, how do you work with people that come to your office that want this, you know, huge heroic dose, which is a big thing now. Um, it's kind of funny because we're in the, you know, in the sixties, it was all, you know, your brain is frying on eggs and all of that kind of propaganda yeah. about, about psychedelics. Right. And now we're in this almost like a countervalence where, you know, series on Netflix about how to change your mind or telling people you just take psychedelics once, you know, you take a huge dose of mushrooms and you're cured and you never had depression again. And so it's really giving people this, um, unrealistic view that um, this this one session is gonna is gonna cure them, and so I have a lot of people coming to me saying, "This is my last chance. I need ketamine." You know, right now we have ketamine. Ketamine is the legal you know medicine we can use. So they come to me and they say, "You know, I need ketamine. I want a huge dose. I don't want to deal with that you know trauma that I have." And so th- I'm getting that more than trying to talk people into like, well, maybe psychedelics would help you, right? So that's interesting that we've had this totally total 180. Um, and then anytime anybody comes to me with that, you know, kind of gung ho attitude, I immediately slow down 
because I work with parts. I, I do a lot of internal family systems work. And what I recognize right away is they have a part of them that's really excited, maybe overly excited and pinned all of their hopes on this session. And I know that inevitably behind that part that's so excited and enthusiastic are some protectors that are saying, hey, we've protected you a long time from this trauma. We've buried the, those exiles that carry that trauma deep down in the psyche. And we don't want you touching that. Right. And so I get really curious when people come to me with all of that excitement to say, wow, this is an indicating that there's probably a polarization in there somewhere. And inevitably, when we slow down, we can find it. But I think a lot of practitioners that don't know how to watch for that say, yes, you're all on board. I'm going to give you this huge dose of ketamine. And so they'll do that. And then the, the client's protector system comes back after the journey or maybe during the journey and says, what are you doing? We've been here for so long protecting you. You can't just knock me out and strip me away. I've been here for you and I'm going to punish you because you told secrets you've never talked about. You've talked about things you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't go there. You're too vulnerable. You don't, you can't rely on people. And so then there's a rubber band effect is what, you know, we call it rubber band effect or backlash. And then and then I have my therapist coming to me that, you know, seek me for consultation saying, I don't know. It just seemed like it was so great. They were so excited about it. But then they had afterward, they, you know, almost relapsed back into feeling depressed or the trauma symptoms. Right. So I kind of learned through trial and error that this is really an important thing. Yeah. I was going to ask you to expand, if you would, on what some of those rubber band symptoms look like. Yeah. So uh, they can show up a lot of, I mean, they're as unique as our protector systems, which are totally individual with each person, right? So, but it, kind of in a general way, it's just, as I said, it's that, you know, the, I, the way that I conceptualize high dose psychedelics is that they put the protectors to sleep. So all the protective system, your managers that keep you functioning, that keep you going to work every day, that, you know, that help you be pro-social, um, the protectors that, um, you know, the, the extreme protectors that keep the exiles tucked away and that, that are in denial or dissociated or whatever, angry, all of those protectors get knocked out and, and asleep during a high dose session. And then they come back and they're not aware of what happened. And that's terrifying for them. And so the way that they can punish, there are all kinds of ways they can punish the system right? So people can have extreme depression, have trauma symptoms percolating up because it's, exiles are almost released from the basement, but the protector has, hasn't been able to keep them um, coming forth in a safe, slow way. So there are a lot of different ways that that rubber band effect can happen in all kinds of ways, somatically, through physical illness, you know, through depression, anxiety, sleeplessness. Yeah. Have you seen patients where they have let's say gone too far too fast in a psychedelic experience. And then they come to you suffering from this, these repercussions afterward. W where do you start with a patient like that? Yeah, I have that happen a lot. The people go to ketamine clinics that have zero therapy support and they're just wheeled there. I had a client that was literally wheelchair to her car to drive home and never spoke to anyone. Oh my God. It's crazy. The kind of things that are happening. Right. And she had all of this trauma come up and had no way of processing it. So she came to me looking for help with integrating that experience. Right. Um, I had another client who took five MEO DMT, which is an extremely powerful, wonderful medicine when you're ready, but it's very potent he merged with the divine, with God, and it was excruciating and terrifying. It was so blissful. It was so blissful. It was terrifying. And he did not know how to make sense of it in his nervous system. So he came to me with PTSD from that experience. These drugs are wonderful. These medicines are wonderful when you're prepared, when your system is ready for them, right? But it can yeah. be too much too soon. Very interesting. And I, and I really appreciate you putting these fine points on, on, especially with some specific different medicines, because we're hearing a lot more about 5-MeO-DMT. And really, I think that the, I don't think people put enough weight on the fact that you can get PTSD from doing these improperly. We think of these as, you know, we, in that we were seeing in the FDA, all this, you know, MDMA for PTSD treatment. Yes. A, a great treatment also when it's done properly. And some of that PTSD can be from other psychedelics. And I think we need to remember that that, and not just say, oh, this is a, a challenging experience or whatever. This is, 
this is PTSD from a psychedelic experience. With patients like that, how, if ever, uh, do you work them back into ever using another psychedelic again? Great question. And, and I do want to say that people can have trauma from doing EMDR too soon and going too deep or doing IFS and incorrectly without any psychedelics. So I think it's an easy shortcut to say, oh, then psychedelics are bad or they're too, what psychedelics are, are, are amplifiers. And so with more power comes more responsibility. You have to know what you're doing as a practitioner that, that's doing these medicines. So I really want to say that because I think it's seductive to then go to say, oh, psychedelics are bad then. And they're not, they're wonderful, wonderful medicines. Um, so how do I work with that? Uh, is that what the question was? Like, how, you- like if, if you think, well, this patient could benefit from, let's just say ketamine therapy, but they've just had PTSD from some either high dose ketamine or another, or let's say even PTSD from, like you said, under the, a breath work or an EMDR. Um, but you think that this, you know, ketamine maybe would be good for them. Let's just use ketamine as an example, some psychedelic, how do you proceed? Well, ketamine's great because you can use that medicine in a lot of different ways, routes of administration and different doses, right? So that, I really love that medicine. I hope you're, you on the video are enjoying my dog walking. Around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great Dane. He's very fun. cute. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the thing with ketamine that's so amazing is that you can use it with a low dose. And the thing I've developed a protocol with what we call cyclitic dose ketamine, with internal family systems. So it's a low enough dose that people can talk through the whole experience. And I do an IFS process. So it just softens the protectors enough that we can get in and do work. And it helps those protectors look around and say, okay, I think this might be safe. I think this might be, well, you might be okay here. And that's really powerful for people, right? So I I usually do that before we go into a deep higher dose session, just so those protectors can feel the medicine and say, okay, I think, I think I'm safe with this. So that's always how I work. I always do. And this is something I talk about in my book, the Theradelic approach, the there's a acronym Panther within the Theradelic approach. And that's the process to follow a treatment protocol for psychedelic therapy. And P is um, preparation. A is attunement and N is needs of the protectors. So this is a step that I take before, and I train all my uh, therapists to do, that you you take before the medicine dosing session, and you do a meditation with the protector system, and you invite the protectors, you invite them forward and say, tell me all your questions and concerns, because this is consent-based, and we will not proceed until you're ready. And I can't tell you how powerful this is, Lynn Marie. It's amazing for people, because those protectors really want to be heard, And people have more reservation than often they're conscious of, like I said in the opening. And so when we slow down and just take the time to to invite those protectors, all kinds of interesting things percolate up about their fears and concerns. And by the way, I don't think this is a fantasy. I don't think people are like fantasizing about talking to their protectors. I actually believe that these facets of the personality live somewhere in some dimension of space and have their own agenda and their own thing going on. It's amazing when you start bringing them forward they're very aware and they're very um dimensional uh their personalities and their ways of being it's pretty amazing and they have questions and concerns that they want addressed so you're looking at what we call the internal family system almost like you're doing family therapy you know if i had a family in my office a mom dad and a kid and the kids acting out i would get permission from the mom and dad before i would work with the child right? And ask them, what are your questions or concerns with, about me working with this child, your kid? I want to do that respectfully with the internal ecosystem. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And and just for all the listeners, if you're not familiar with um, internal family systems or IFS, first, we did an episode back with Nick Bruss on this uh, a while back. We didn't call it IFS in the, in the title. I forget what we called it, but look up Nick. But um, Sunny, if you also would just give us maybe just a a one or two sentence overview of what internal family systems is, and then specifically like if you just a little bit more on what the protectors, like how does a protector arise and and what role do they play in kind of your everyday life? Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, So internal family systems is the idea that we have um, all have multiple personalities that live within us. So they break down into a couple of different categories. We have managers, managers 
and protectors that are in one category and they kind of manage the whole system, like I mentioned earlier. Some of them get really extreme and they can be extreme parts that are called firefighters. And um, they do things like addiction, suicidality. They get really, really extreme. Behind all managers, the reason why they're developed is that they're protecting something. And what they're protecting are what's called exiles. These are younger personalities within the system that have been holding pain and suffering and harm. And then, of course, we have all kinds of what we call self-like parts that are healthy parts of us, right? Behind all of that ecosystem is what we call the self with a capital S. And that self energy is calm, compassionate, confident, curious. It's all these C words, right, that Dick Schwartz came up with. And, and this has this, this kind of benevolent well-being. And most of us understand this feeling. Like when often, you know, psychedelics can put us in self energy, right? It's without agenda. It's benevolent. It's calm. It's like what we call our higher self or our, our Christ consciousness or Buddha, you know, the, the enlightened Buddha. We have all kinds of names for the same kind of energy, right? And so our goal in IFS is to help unburden the managers, the protectors, the exiles, and help them be more connected to that self energy so that they can be playful and happy and calm and confident and all these wonderful qualities. And so that's the work of IFS therapists is to, is to help people connect with self energy. And I found that combined with archetypal psychology and certain aspects of EMDR, which is an eye processing, eye movement processing protocol for trauma, that amalgamation, which is the theradelic approach is super effective with psychedelic therapy. So, um, so, so IFS is couched within the theradelic approach. It's, we use a lot of the techniques and, you know, I work with Dick Schwartz. We do retreats together and, um, you know, and trainings together. So we're pretty close and I, I really use IFS a lot in my, in my therapy uh, practice and what I teach. For those of you who don't know, um, Dick Schwartz is the founder of IFS, correct? The creator of that concept. Um, let's say somebody has, uh, cause you were talking about the exiles being these younger selves. What if somebody you know, tomorrow has a, a, a psychedelic or other experience. I, I mean, I recall specifically Tim Ferriss talking about how he had his trauma come up during a 10 day Vipassana silent meditation retreat. So let's say somebody goes through any kind of thing that, that brings up some trauma or even let's say the five MEO experience that is too far too fast and gives them PTSD, but they're an adult. And so what, like, how does a, a current trauma that happens that may lead to PTSD uh, show up in the IFS when like, I think we think of a lot of the, the exiles, like you said, as being younger. Am I, am I understanding young wrong in a different, in like a time way that it's, that's improper? I think that's a great question. First of all, I'll say, you know, I've been a trauma therapist for a couple of decades and I haven't, I haven't come across very many people that have a single adult trauma. So I'll say that those are definitely unicorns in the situation. Almost always, you know, and I discovered this working with veterans because a lot of veterans have trauma from their, their duty, you know, tours of duty, but then inevitably we would uncover earlier trauma. That was kind of like the reason why they went into the military in the first place. Right. So it's kind of an interesting thing, like finding adult trauma that is a one episode thing that said exiles can also be adult parts, right? That there's no rule that they have to be that. These are general categories. And it's kind of like a, a cartography of the internal ecosystem. But the thing I love about IFS is it's non-pathologizing and it's endlessly curious. So you're always inviting your clients and your client's internal ecosystem to inform you about what's going on. I'm not dictating, oh, that's a manager and that's an exile and you don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing about IFS that's like that. It's, it's a very collaborative, curious approach based on the idea that every person has an inherent self that cannot be damaged and that all the parts have good intention, really. And that's kind of hard to get your mind around when you learn IFS because even suicidal parts that are very extreme, you're saying, how can that be? a positive that wants something good. But when you really engage that part that's feeling suicidal, it's interesting because you get down to its intention and it really wants to end suffering. And it's just confused about how to do that. Right. So it's a very different paradigm. And what we're seeing with the popularity of IFS, I mean, they have 40,000 clinicians trying to get trained in IFS right now at the Institute. I mean, it's like hugely popular because it's incredibly effective. So 
so using that with the same understanding in psychedelic therapy, you know, we talk a lot in psychedelic therapy about inherent, the inherent wisdom of the psyche. There's an inherent wisdom and, and a, and a natural desire to heal within the internal system. So that partners really beautifully with those two things. And so what we're doing is really trying to remove the obstacles of, of what's blocking someone from their well being, rather than trying to make them become someone else. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Um, as far as trauma goes with these different parts, let's, if we could talk about the, the, let's say the trauma that you don't recall, right there, some people have, you know, their hidden or buried traumas. Is that something that the protectors are keeping from us? And can you talk about what that looks like in, you know, because I know a lot of people in, you know, part of the, uh, reason that they're doing a psychedelic may be because they want to uncover trauma. They know that there's something there. There's something that's, you know, causing them to be stuck, but they would like it to come out. Can you talk about how facilitating the protector to allow that to happen may benefit them? Beautiful question. It's so right on. I have almost, uh, probably once a month, I have a client who uncovers unknown trauma in a psychedelic session. It's really common. And this is why I'm always telling facilitators, please, please, please get training in trauma because it happens all the time. And you might not think, you know, you talk to your client before and you get them ready for the journey and they say, oh no, I had a perfect childhood, which is by the way, always a sign, right? You're like, okay, <laughs> I if that's possible, but um, just because we live in such a traumatizing culture, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, really being ready to deal with what comes up is really important and absolutely you're right on protectors keep those exiles so buried that they are completely dissociated um i have a client that i've worked with for a long time who had a lot of signs that she had trauma she had eating disorders she had gone to the hospital within a fugue state. So she had, she went in with amnesia and they couldn't find anything wrong with her. So she had a lot of the markers of trauma, but she couldn't recall anything. She said, Oh yeah, I had a great childhood. And now as we've been working and working with ketamine, a lot of childhood trauma and abuse has percolated up and being able to, to see it and work with it. And it's been, it's been really difficult for her a path, but it's been so relieving because she always felt like there was something there and it's incredible how those memories, those parts hold those memories and can be, and can come in and be so crystal clear with holding what happened. It's really amazing to witness something like that. You know, and again, being a trauma therapist, you have to be skilled enough to know what is symbolic in a psychedelic journey. What's a literal memory. You don't want to do any kind of leading or prompting the client to, to fill in any kind of you know, directing them to anything, you're really tracking where they are and letting them uncover their own path, again, at the speed in which their protector system is ready for that. And and you bring up a good point there that I was going to ask you about is false memories. And how do you know, like you said, you have to be trained to know, is this literal? Is this metaphoric? And is there the the fear that that something is coming up that is not literal or is not exactly what happened is some version thereof or, or maybe a mistakenly remembered, like what, can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah. And you know, I think we're kind of like coasting off the fumes of the horrible eighties, which was that, you know, people were saying that people were just making things up and it was really coming out of um, people coming forward that were sexually abused uh, in churches. And of course the church systems were like, Oh no, that would never happen. And as we've seen, all kinds of abuse has occurred, right? And so I really want to couch this conversation in, I believe you, I believe you. If you have symptoms and they're not going away, you're not just making this up for fun or in your free time. It's So I really want to make that a strong statement because so many victims, it makes me so angry how many victims are not believed, are mistrusted, are gaslit, right? By not only their families, by therapists that don't, I mean, I don't think less therapists, but medical communities, um, police, our culture at large. So I really want to drive that point home. I almost never think, oh, someone's just making this up. I haven't really seen a lot of that. <laughs> Hardly any sexual abuse gets reported. It's much more common 
than we think. If we rewind back to when Freud was, was, you know, in his day, a hundred and however many years ago, he, he thought that women were just hysterical and just making up stuff because incest would never happen in a family. That was his take on it. Never. It would never happen. And so he just made it so that the women were crazy. And in a way we kind of have this happening in our culture still. So I want to, I want to thank you. Yes. Yeah, part that. <laughs> Please put that point on that because that's something that I always hear in the, as a discussion, you know, if something comes up that we had no idea was there before, how do we trust that, that, you know, even in ourselves, not like, Oh, I don't trust that you made it up. It's like, did I just make, did some part of my creative brain make that up or well, did that really happen? Yeah, and my poor clients go through a whole phase of just not trusting their own memories. So what I, what the first thing is really the pervasiveness of these memories, the clarity of them, right? The, the specific, specific specificity. <laughs> that's, that's right. What is it? And usually with trauma, what happens is we can remember certain things that are very salient and then other things that are kind of foggy as we're processing them. So it might be like a smell is really, really pertinent to, you know, like strong in their memory, but they can't remember how they got in the room with the guy and they can't remember exactly what his face looked like. And so you think, oh, that didn't happen to you because you can't remember. But trauma works like that. We dissociate from things because it's totally overwhelming to our nervous system. And so we'll, so it's almost like it's, I think of it like it's partially digested material. It's almost like one part of it is still super um, vivid, but the rest of it isn't. And then as we do trauma work, the rest of those um, memories and the, the beginning, middle and end start to tend to start to fill in. So you see that, you know, after you've been doing it for a while, you start to see that process happening. And it's just this persistence of these memories. They're not, and they're not being changed. They keep coming back to the same thing, right? And oftentimes what happens, the way our psyches start pointing us to these memories is through symbolic dreams and symbolism in our um, journeys. And so there might be some kind of weird sexual images that come up in the journey that are very kind of symbolic and archetypal. And so I just kind of note that like, oh, that's interesting. I don't assume it's anything. I'm just curious about that. And I want the parts. I engage with the parts of the person, right? The managers and the exiles to say, tell me more about that symbol of the snakes crawling up your leg. For example, that was one client that kept having that come up. And then it ended up being a memory that was repressed and it started being filled in with what that was. And I was not directing that at all. I'm just inviting the person to fill in the, fill in the details. Right. Yeah. And if they lose, and then if all of a sudden that doesn't seem like an important memory and they move on to something else and it doesn't come back in, then I'm like, okay, that was just like, you know, some fleeting thing. Right. Yeah. So it's, I think that's the persistence. And it's the vividness and how it comes into focus as we work more with it. These parts want people to remember. They want to heal. They want to let their stories be told. And so our job as therapists is to clear the clutter so we can really hear the system and trust the system. The system knows. The system knows. Thank you for that explanation. I really appreciate that. That really does uh, clarify things. And I was going to ask, and this is related to psychedelics, but also related to basically any type of therapy, like you said, that can uncover these hidden, let's say hidden or, or repressed or unknown traumas is that it takes courage to do this. How do you chat with a patient who may be saying like, well, if I go into this therapy and I uncover something like one, like you said, it's really hard in that period afterward. And two, you know, this may affect their family life if they uncover, you know, somebody in their close circle or, or their family that had been the perpetrator of some kind of trauma. What does it look like in the discussions with patients who are, are afraid of the possibilities of uncovering that trauma? I think that that happens almost all the time. People know something's there. They're terrified to uncover They've, their protectors have created a life. They've pieced together a life that they don't want disrupted. And I honor that. I don't have an agenda whatsoever. If you do not want to go there, I'm not going to, I'm not going to force you to do that. If your system is not ready. I mean, this is part of our discussion um, of the whole you know topic today. Slow down. If you're not ready, if you, I've had clients come to me and say, I don't want to go there. And I say, I I'm fine with that. You can come back and I'm here for you when you're ready. Right. But I'm also here for you if you want to do it slowly and progress, right? I don't, I don't know what's going on with you. 
the other person, their subjective distress is what's going to inform me about what to track. Right. So yeah, it's terrifying. It takes a lot of courage. And if you're not ready to do that, don't do it yet. That's okay. But what I've found is on the other side of processing trauma, it can be hell for a while. I have a client right now that's right in the middle of going through it. It's hard. It's hard. It's exactly the situation that you painted. It's really difficult. There's, you know, sometimes it's not easy, but on the other side of that, there's clarity, there's connection to self, there's confidence. You're not walking around watching your back all the time. You're not distrusting your reality. You get your life back. Right. And yeah. I believe in not only resiliency, but I believe in post-traumatic growth. I see it all the time coming through those situations and really feeling, finding meaning in that crazy suffering that shouldn't have ever happened to you in the first place. And it's never excusable, but being able to find your own power in coming back from something like that and meaning in that is amazing. And I want to, you know, sing that from the rooftops for people, right? You've already been through the trauma. It reminds me of Gabor Mate had a um, metaphor that I really liked. He said, trauma is like a sliver that's buried in the arm, like in your, in the deep skin of your arm, and it's got an infection around it. And all of your coping mechanisms, all of your protectors using IFS language is like building a giant layer of scar tissue on top of that. And you could just go through life with that. And you could just put lotion on the top of that scar and just kind of make it, try to make it look pretty and go. And that's okay. But you could go in and, and surgically remove the sliver that's been offending your system the whole time. And once you remove that sliver, you will start to heal. Your arm will heal. It won't have infection anymore. Right. But removing that sliver hurts. It's painful. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's a process, but you don't have to deal with that sliver anymore. And that's kind of how I imagine going through trauma work. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking as you were speaking, because we've seen a lot of the stories with specifically MDMA, how that compound has the ability to remove your fear center a little bit, take it offline during the session to where you may be re-experiencing it or something may be coming up for the first time, but you, you know, you're not looking at it through the same fearful lens because the amygdala is, is not as involved. Is that different from what happens with other substances like psilocybin or uh, ketamine if a trauma comes up during one of those medicines? Well, I mean, MDMA is a unique medicine because it doesn't just work on the 5-HT2A receptor system, the serotonergic receptor system, but all the classic psychedelics do like psilocybin and M or, uh, ayahuasca and LSD, all of those. Ketamine works on the NMDA receptors. Ketamine is very reliably good at shutting down the right amygdala. So ketamine is actually better than MDMA to shut down the fear center of the brain because it works on those NMDA receptors. MDMA can work like that too. Um, so what was your question about? Is it reliable to work with softening the protector system? Oh, no, it was just, I, I, and, and you, you answered is, well, I was mostly thinking of ketamine because that's what, like you said, what's available, but I was unaware and maybe I had been aware, but forgotten that, uh, the NMDA interaction with ketamine can have a similar effect on the amygdala so that, okay. Because I was, I was thinking, okay, if we're looking at being nervous, going in and possibly uncovering a trauma, is it better to go with one of the medicines where the amygdala is, is, uh, shut down versus something like a psilocybin or ayahuasca where I don't, where it has a different mechanism. Absolutely. In my opinion, yes. I think the ketamine is a wonderful way to start and, and MDMA probably too, because it's so gentle to that system. What I love about ketamine is, and Jeff Becker has done some great research on the neurons in the brain and how ketamine works versus classic psychedelics. And his short answer is ketamine is kind of like letting off the break and other psychedelics are like flooring it on the gas. So what I like about ketamine is it's gentle like that. And it puts us in this ability to observe our trauma because we're out of, outside of it. And this is because of the parametal frontal cortex and how it works with down regulating that, that it adjusts our sense of time. And so we can get into that observer self energy and, and look at the trauma with some distance. And so it, we can really leverage IFS with the effects of ketamine. I think MD may probably work similarly. Um, and so then we can get in and really do some trauma work. So here's where therapy comes in because there's not enough focus on how important the therapy is. Gould Dolan did some great research on critical learning windows. It's beautiful research and how psychedelics can really open critical learning windows. And this is where the therapy comes in. 
Because what you have is this ability to then for a good therapist who knows what they're doing, right? This is really important because critical learning windows open us up to re rework early memories, right? So if you have a good therapist who knows what they're doing, they can really guide you through working through trauma and anchoring that change in your brain, right? So, so I think that's one of the best ways to work with trauma. And I've seen, I've had clients that I've worked, you know, uh, EMDR, IFS for years, we've made some progress, but then we get ketamine on board and it's like totally helped them and amplified the benefit. I love that. And thank you. And thank you for the, the explanation. And by the way, I will, dear listeners, I will do everything in my power to get ghoul on. She and I are giving grand rounds together at Stanford next week. So I will, I will ask because I would love to have a, just a full discussion on those critical learning periods. Oh, I, yeah. That's, who, who's not cool. Who did research on octopus oct- getting cuddly right. on MBMA. <laughs> like she's, yes. the, she got, she won me over with that study. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. And and when I first met her in person, she said, uh, are you free in February to come search for, for octopus in Costa Rica? We need to, somebody to help us in the tide pools. I'm like, man, your job is cool. Like That, that is a very cool well, job. <laughs> but like you have to find your own octopus for this study. Very cool. Very cool. But yes, listeners, I will try to bring her on because that, you know, had I known when I had done certain psychedelics, the exact like ketamine being a good one is that they, you know, she found the critical period, I think is open 48 hours. Uh, then I would have been like, okay, let's have the, let's have my therapy session then not, you know, two weeks later or whenever, like having the specificity that she uncovered in her study is just going to be very, you know, crucial to optimizing these experiences. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I wrote the Theradelic approach and I, I use this term, the golden hour. And this was just from anecdotal experience of, you know, working with a thousand plus patients and seeing that that hour, as they were coming out of a deep ketamine experience, I could get all of this work done. And that's where that was happening and really anchoring and creating enduring change. And I didn't have that study that I I hadn't read that study yet. So when I read it, it was like, Oh, this all makes total sense. The last piece of the puzzle, the golden hour correlates to this critical learning window, right? And how important it is to do that integration while people are still in the space. And and I'm glad that you brought that up. Are you doing when you do, let's say your IFS work or parts work with people, um, do you do it? I know you said, at least with ketamine, you're giving a psycholytic dose for those listeners. That means not psychedelic. That's you're not blasting off into ego disillusion. You are still with the patient. Um, but are you doing most of the work after the the bulk of the the intensity of the experience is over? Well, I do. I'm pretty creative with um, how I work with patients and it's really customized to each patient. And I do gr- a lot of group work now, which is my favorite. But so I do psycholytic dose, which is a low dose. It's low. It's it's high enough that you are feeling some psychedelic effects, but you're still able to engage and we can talk through the whole session. I also do what I call mid dose sessions, which are more of a psych- psychedelic dose of ketamine where people are, you know, the classic with the eye mask on and listening to music and going inside. And that, you know, la- depending on how we're dosing people, if we're giving injections over time or two, you know, one small injection, a big injection, it can be like an hour, hour and a half. And then they come out for that third hour. And that's when we're doing this work. So that third hour that I call the golden hour of a, of a mid dose ketamine session is similar to the psycholytic dose that you can do with talking to patients throughout the entire journey. If that makes sense, they're kind of in that same space. Got it. So with that cycle, I would be interested to talk to Ghoul and see if, if psycholytic dose ketamine opens some kind of critical learning window while they're in it. Because what, what I found with my patients and, and training a lot of clinicians to do this technique that I do with IFS and psycholytic dose ketamine, it's amazing how change occurs. It's, it's pretty amazing. So I I would guess that she would find, um, that would be the case. Yeah. That would be very interesting to know. As we wrap up, I would love to hear just some parting thoughts on, again, this, you know, how you have worked with people and I, you know, um, you speak a lot in the industry, how you are addressing, like we talked about in the intro, this, this thought that more is better. I mean, it's one thing to to get people to really like sit down and listen to an episode like this where they're learning about the parts and the protectors and and why um, that these might not want to go so quickly, uh, so and, and with such a deep dose. But how how have you been maybe messaging this or speaking with people about combating what you know and just even educating like you know before you go to to a five meo 
retreat, <laughs> how do you know that you're, you know, you are ready for that? Because those are getting very popular and, you know, it's a powerful medicine when done in the right situation. But like you said, how do we know that they have properly prepared for that right situation and all those kinds of things? So if you could just talk a little bit about just general education on this yeah, arena. Absolutely. You know, we have this, this big narrative in our culture of the heroic dose or ego dissolution. I always hear this. And when, when the, your protector system hears ego dissolution, they get terrified, right? They're just like, what? I'm not, I'm here for a reason. So um, trust your protector system slow down. I promise if you slow down and really get curious about what your protectors need, you will go so much further with these medicines. It, it really is not a race. It's, it's, it's slow and steady and you're going to be able to get more work done. You know, I think this is a, you know, part of this messaging is really getting away from this, this patriarchal male dominated paradigm of like, you know, going crazy and going big and, you know, dominating everything and really more of this feminine approach of like, let's be soft, let's be curious, let's, let's be open to the experience. Let's, let's kind of play in this and see how, how it goes and with curiosity and gentleness. And, you know, I think there's, there's room for that in, in this space because these medicines are very powerful. Right. And it, it doesn't mean that you're not doing the work I've had. I can tell you so many stories of clients that were doing heroic doses just to dissociate. And when we did a low dose, they got so much work done and it was a really intense session, but very productive. So trust me, low dose doesn't mean that you're weak or you're not doing the thing. You're definitely doing the work. Right. And so, you know, that, that would be how I would talk about it is trust the protector system, go slow to go fast um, yeah. And yeah. just ask all the system if they're ready to go. And it's important for me to know, I love big doses. I think big doses of psychedelics are awesome when appropriate, when appropriate. Yes. And, and I think you put a, a point on redefining the goal because like, I think you said so many people come in and this is one of my pet peeves is like, uh, why group therapy is difficult for me because after every single time, they'll be everybody compares notes. Did you have ego dissolution? Did you meet God like these goals that are like these crazy? Like, did you dissociate? Did you? Uh, how about did I get to examine my trauma and <laughs> did I find a place of compassion? Right, like the goals that have been seemingly kind of the sexy ones and in retreat <laughs> settings are not necessarily the ones that are therapeutically useful and sometimes can be therapeutically harmful. Right. Yeah, and I think so much of that too is how the session is being hosted, right? I mean, the container and how, and what's being um, facilitated by your group leaders, you know? So that's really important too, is how that's held in the space. Because I think you can get hooked into that, this competitiveness, you know, journey competition. <laughs> it's it's a it, thing. <laughs> thing. Preach. Yes. Thank you for putting a point on like, look at who, you know, who you are going to the retreat of and, and how they have framed thing and what kind of expectation or lack thereof they have set for you. Like if I would love the expectation just to be that you have had the courage to go in and do a thing. If you've gone and done the thing, all right, expectation met, right? Like instead of setting these other expectations, like I was in a study where they just kept giving me five until I blasted off, blasted off, right? Like this, this is, you know, like what is even happening here? This is, this is not therapeutic, right? Like just think about what, make sure that they're therapeutic goals are the same as your therapeutic goals. Yeah. Um, and one other thing, this is totally out of order, but I still want to ask because people may be wondering this, is if somebody has taken a psychedelic at a higher dose and nothing happened, might it be those protectors? Absolutely. Up? absolutely. I like your thinking. That's absolutely right. I've been amazed at other, I, I was a trainer at other people's trainings and they would give these huge doses. I don't tend to give huge doses like that. And I would be amazed at how some people that were terrified could hold on and they would just keep giving them more and more ketamine and they could hold on, hold on until they would just like, uh, you know, like their psyche would just be obliterated for an hour and then they come back. So yes, absolutely. And that, by the way, is the worst way to do it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I was to your, the last question that you asked, I was thinking about something that I say at every retreat and training that I, that I host, there's every way to do this right and no way to do it wrong. There's every way to do it right. You can't do it wrong. You can't journey wrong. <laughs> Even difficult, too high of experiences. Sometimes you have to do a lot of work to try to repair after with your protector system, but it's okay. You can do that. You know, it, you can work on that. And you know, it's, it's not ideal, 
but don't beat yourself up if you took too much, you know, accidentally and you didn't, you didn't break your system. You can't break yourself, your self energy with a capital S you can help, you know, you can, you can work on it. There's always, there's always space to come back home to yourself. Always, always. Well, that is the most beautiful way to wrap this up, Sunny. Thank you so much for that. Can you please let the listeners and the viewers on YouTube, now that we are going to be on YouTube and and all all the places, uh, can you please let them know where to find out more about you and your work? Absolutely. Everything is on my website. It's just sunnystrasburg.com, S-U-N-N-Y-S-T-R-A-S-B-U-R-G.com. And then um, I'm on all the social media, Sunny Strasburg LMFT. You can find me there. Thank you so much, Sunny. I've absolutely loved this discussion. It's been a true honor having you on today. Thanks, Lynn Marie. It was really fun. Thank you. All right. For everybody else out there, until next time.